Welcome to VCE Biology, I'm Mr. Dean and I'd like to thank you for all attending and coming to the very first podcast or online presentation regarding our studies in VCE Biology. This is going to be a supplementary material aimed at helping students who either miss class or would like a little bit of consolidation material outside of class and prefer to be working with something that's a bit more audible and something that's perhaps a little bit more interactive on the video. So, what is this biology going to be? Well, today we're going to be talking about what's in a cell. We're going to be recapping some of the cell organelles, some of their structures and particularly their functions, two very important phrases that we're going to see throughout our studies here in VCE Biology. We're going to be talking about most of the organelles pertaining to plant, human, uh, archaea, bacterial cells uh, and particularly we'll use this as a basis of distinction between our eukarya and our prokarya. A lot of this will be considered to be our uh, basis of understanding when we go into units 3 and 4, but it's a good, I think, starting point for the rest of our studies. So let's jump into it. What's in a cell? And what better place to start than the nucleus? Obviously, the nucleus is going to be hopefully familiar to most of you, beginning our studies into what uh, is actually in a cell. So structurally, our nucleus is composed of a double membrane wrapped structure. We can see this from this little diagram that I've ripped from uh, Google Images. We've got this double wrapped structure, often depicted as a purple, usually due to the staining when we find it uh, through microscopes. Then we've got, it contains uh, these sort of pores here. We can see these little indicated by these spots, these nuclear pores. And functionally when we talk about the nucleus we're talking about that it contains genetic information so if we can see here on the diagram we've got these chromosomes that we hopefully understand that they contain some form of DNA or genetic information in other species inside here we can also see that we've got this uh, purple sort of mass this is called our nucleolus the nucleolus isn't covered a lot in the VCE study design but for those who are also looking to understand what it is, we've got this nucleolus within the center of our overall structure of the nucleus that is involved in the production of ribosomes, which we'll get to further in the piece. Uh, so very important when we're talking about the functionality of the nucleus, we're talking about that it contains mainly the genetic function of the cell and that it ensures that the genetic material is protected. It's also able to control what comes in and out through these pores, but it's also obviously important to contain and protect our genetic information. Next up, just as we spoke about uh, being produced from the nucleolus itself, we've got the ribosomes. Ribosomes are very important throughout our cell. Structurally, they are composed of proteins and a ribosomal RNA. Not super important at this point, but just understand that they're composed of both proteins and RNA. Uh, as indicated from the diagram, diagram I should say, uh, they are composed of two key subunits. Not important at the moment to remember that we've got a small and a large, but just to know that they're composed by two main units and they are found free floating around the cell and around the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Hint, hint about what we might be covering next. So functionally, we're talking about when, we, when we're thinking about ribosomes, they're involved in protein synthesis. And what do I mean by protein synthesis? Well, usually in VCE bio, we love to talk about uh, some of our more complicated words, but really what this means is we're just talking about building proteins, building, making, composing, protein synthesis, this is what ribosomes do. And more specifically, they're taking these amino acids, which we'll learn about later in the course, but just think about these as our sort of our building blocks of proteins. These are our building blocks of proteins that they uh, come together and are assembled into proteins at the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Seen down here on the diagram, we've got our rough endoplasmic reticulum here is these sort of sacs with these little dots down here that are indicated as ribosomes. And these are all over it, sort of like freckles are all across that help assist build proteins. Moving aptly along to the endoplasmic reticulum, we've got here is a membrane wrap structure found near the nucleus, a matrix of membranes, folds, and sacs called cystinae. You can see them here. These are sort of these gapped structures that are sort of laid around the nucleus here and here and here. We've got two main different types. We've got our rough and our smooth endoplasmic reticulum indicated here as our our rough ER, which are the ones sort of covered or freckled with little dots, and these are our ribosomes from the previous side. Our smooth endoplasmic reticulum is over here, and it's noted as being smooth because it isn't covered in ribosomes. Functionally, these uh, endoplasmic reticulum are basically only differed by two different things. This rough endoplasmic reticulum down here covered with the ribosomes is the site of protein synthesis. So most of the proteins or all of the proteins in the cell uh, are composed here at the rough endoplasmic reticulum. 
Over here, we've got our smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is our endoplasmic reticulum without any of the ribosomes, is the site of our lipid synthesis, very important for our membranes and some of the other structures that we've got. Moving right along, our next organelle we'll be talking about is our Golgi apparatus. Golgi apparatus structurally is a matrix of membrane folds and sacs, again called cystinae, wrapped in other membranes. So it's uh, so over here again, we've got our cis-facing side of the Golgi apparatus. This is usually the side that faces the endoplasmic reticulum at some point. Then we've got all our cystinae folds in membranes and things over here. It's positioned close to the rough ER and the cell membrane. So why is it positioned close to the rough ER? rough endoplasmic reticulum, well that's because it processes and packages proteins and as we said the rough endoplasmic reticulum was the site of protein synthesis so it makes a lot of sense for our Golgi apparatus that's here to process and package our proteins to be fairly close. Uh, when we say package we talk about them being wrapped in these membrane bound vesicles and so they end up in these little vesicles here that are full of protein and they are usually exported out of the cell. I say usually 99% of the time they'll be exported out of the cell, we'll talk about an exception a little later on. So these little membrane bound vesicles are usually created in the Golgi apparatus filled with proteins from the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then are usually exported outside of the cell. But of course all of these processes so far don't just happen, they require a little bit of energy and this is where our mitochondria comes on. So structurally our mitochondria again, like most of our organelles so far, are highly membrane bound organelles and they contain these highly folded membra membrane structures called cristae indicated here. So we've got our first membrane that sort of bounds the mitochondrion and then we've got our inner membrane here that's got all these twists and folds in our cristae. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about the mitochondria when we get to uh, learning about uh, respiration and in particular photosynthesis as well, uh, but just to give you an idea we've got this first membrane on the outside then we've got this highly folded inner membrane often drawn like this when you see them in exams. Functionally hopefully most of you understand the mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell. It generates energy from the breakdown of organic sources and typically when we talk about mitochondria within humans we're talking about them uh, generating energy through respiration, which is the breakdown of sugars into uh, to generate an adenosine triphosphate or ATP, the sort of cellular uh, kind of energy that we use. Located down here uh, also where we've got our adenosine, a little bit of ribose and our three triphosphates. Moving away from perhaps moving cells in and out and moving around, we've got our centriole. Uh, these are our small structures composed of microtubules. When we're talking about microtubules, they're essentially these sort of building rods that exist around. They're used in many parts of the cell uh, and they compose these centrioles. Centrioles are positioned also at the poles of the cell, sort of two ends of the cell, indicated down here at this little diagram where we've got. And this is where they're able to perform their function, which is they're involved in the development of these spindle fibers and that they assist in cell division. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, we've got these two centrioles that exist at, the, say, the north and the south pole of the cell, and when a cell needs to replicate and needs to make new cells, these sort of centri uh, centrioles create these little fibers that sort of push against each other, and they allow the cell to line up, and they ensure that the cells kind of divide evenly. Uh, pretty important uh, parts of the cell, particularly in cell division. Our next organelle we're going to be talking about is going to be the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. Uh, pretty important, again, structurally we're talking about a semi-permeable structure that encases that encase the cell and the cytoplasm. So a lot of going on, yeah, a lot of words going on in this first sentence. Semi-permeable. What I mean by this is it's sort of a structure that allows certain things to pass through, but not all. Consider it to be sort of the walls and or something in your house where occasionally something can go through the wall, but most things can't. It encases the cell and the cytoplasm which is the cytosol and the, flu uh, and the organelles. So the organelles we've talked about so far include the nucleus and the Golgi apparatus and the rough endoplasmic reticulum as such. These are our organelles that we've been talking about. The cytosol itself is the floating liquid and the fluid that exists within the cell. And so the cytoplasm pertains both of these things. And so the plasma membrane or the cell membrane uh, sort of surrounds all of these in a structural manner. Functionally, when we talk about the plasma membrane or the cell membrane, they give the cells uh, their structure and they give them some stability. Really important in different environments that these tiny, tiny uh, building blocks of life are able to have some sort of stability. They also allow the cells to control what goes in or out of them. So as I said, m the plasma membrane is semi-permeable. It's able to control what comes in and what comes out, which is really important when we're thinking about uh, particularly getting rid of waste and bringing in nutrients. 
down here I've also got two diagrams of how the cell membrane resembles in uh, both an animal cell and a bacterial cell and right next to it I've got this sort of diagram of the plasma membrane. Don't worry too much about some of the specifics that are going on in this diagram. This is just meant to give you an idea of what the plasma membrane looks like in uh, particularly animal cells but we'll get more onto that when we talk about some of our plasma membrane structures. Next up is peroxisomes, some of our more niche organelles that you may or may not have heard of so far. Structurally, these are double membrane wrapped structures that contain DNA and proteins. Shown down here, we've got this membrane bound sort of uh, structure with this sort of fluid or end core within. Functionally, they're not super uh, common when we talk about organelles, but they can be very important. They contain some DNA, as we said, and some proteins related to the metabolism of harmful materials in the cell. So for example, I put, an, uh, I put hydrogen peroxide down here, H2O2. I haven't quite figured out how to make the two small yet, but this is two hydrogens and two oxygens. Uh, this can be really toxic and dangerous if it builds up within a cell. So we need these peroxisomes to house some DNA and some proteins to be able to break it down for us. Moving right along to the vacuole, a very similar sort of structure to our peroxisomes. These are large membrane bound vesicles, usually containing water or nutrient fluid. Shown here in this large diagram, we've got this large mass uh, of a just a very simple sort of vesicle, like something you might imagine coming out of the Golgi apparatus, containing usually uh, water or nutrient fluid particularly important in plants, uh, plants as it gives them a way to maintain the what I've said here important in plants as a way to maintain their turgidity and what do I mean by turgidity I mean that their sort of hardness their sort of stiffness and a lot of uh, sort of stability to their cell uh, in other eukaryotes such as humans we might use them as a way to sort of uh, store nutrients uh, in times of need so for example if I have sugars or salts or something in my environment I might like to sort of take I might store them within a cell within a vacuole and just as a clarification the word tonoplastia just refers to the largest vacuole of a plant cell or the most uh, main or the chief vacuole in a plant cell Sticking here with the theme of plants, we have the chloroplast, and these are structurally important, uh, very important for plants. These are membrane wrapped structures, just like a bunch of the other organelles that we've talked about so far. They contain stacks of thylakoids called grana, not super important. We'll get a lot more into some of these terms when we talk about some of our plant structures later on in VCE biology. But what you need to know is that they are these double membrane structures in plants, and they contain these little stacks that we call uh, singly, we call them thylakoids, and we have the plural their granum. Functionally they are the site of photosynthesis in plants and some bacteria and some archae, uh, or archaea I should say. A uh, little typo down there, they use light, carbon dioxide and water to make glucose as an energy source, not, not as an energy source, as an energy source. Hopefully you guys know that about photosynthesis. We, in the presence of some light, plants are able to turn some carbon dioxide and some water to make glucose as an energy source. Really important and just to make the distinction it can also happen in some bacteria and some archaea. Moving right along to probably the last of our plant structures we've got here, their cell wall. Structurally it's a rigid layer of polysaccharides or sugars surrounding the cell of plants, fungi and bacteria. Again notably not just plants but bacteria as well and fungi indicated here in this uh, sort of diagram we've got this really thickened wall not like sort of animal cells when we talk about them with a plasma membrane that's quite soft quite fluid uh, quite almost squishy we've got this really hardened cell wall here in plants fungi and bacteria functionally it enables the cells of plants in particular to retain stability and turgidity again uh, important here that's sort of a hardness uh, and it also enables them some signaling and some cell to cell communication. Moving on to some of the really interesting sort of cellular components here, we've got cilia and flagella, two really important structures that actually aren't in the cell themselves. So structurally, when we talk about them, they're composed of microtubules. These are structures that are external to the cell. So they're sort of sitting on the outside of the cell and they're usually anchored to the cell membrane. Functionally, when we talk about cilia and flagella, flagella itself helps cells in moving around their environment important for bacteria so down here in this little diagram you can see these little tails these are the flagella or singular when we talk about them we say the flagellum and they help them sort of move around uh, their environment if you think about the sort of aqueous environment the bacteria in our gut or in our nose or in our uh, esophagus or something like that the way they might leave it might be really important for them to be able to move around 
cilia, they help uh, cells trap material, so these are some cilia, I think from the epithelium cells of the human gut, and they help trap food for the breakdown or uh, sort of things like that. Moving on to plastids, these are our last organelles we'll be going through in our first uh, here episode of VCE Biology. Structurally, they are small membrane-bound structures that contain DNA, proteins, and organic compounds. Very similar to our chloroplasts. In fact, chloroplasts themselves are a member of the plastid family. But there are plenty of other common plastids that exist. Functionally, they contain genetic information for the synthesis and the storage of a diversity of of a diverse range of molecules, sorry there. So when we think about plastids, we're thinking about a double membrane structure that holds important proteins that cells might not always need or perhaps may or, uh, need in times uh, of particular stress. Now, putting that all together, we've got our eukarya versus our prokarya. So finishing this episode off, hopefully you'll have seen that we've got a really large amount of different organelles that exist, and a lot of them are only in eukarya, some are in prokarya, some are in both. But our key differences when we're talking about our, our eukarya and our prokarya are that our prokaryotes have no membrane-bound organelles. So you would have seen that many of the, mem uh, many of the organelles we've talked about so far are membrane-bound. They uh, have a membrane around them or they have a membrane that attaches them to their position within the cell, whereas eukaryotes do. So eukaryotes are our uh, animal cells, our plant cells that have these membrane-bound organelles. Our second difference is that eukaryotes also have a true nucleus, a true nucleus. So when we talk about a true nucleus, that is one that is wrapped in a membrane. Prokaryotes are rather have a genetic information free floating in particular regions. So for example, uh, we have our bacterial cell down here. I can tell by the fact it likely has a flagella end of its shape. Uh, it has more of a region where our genetic material might exist that is not actually wrapped up in any sort of membrane. Uh, whereas in our animal cell, we have this large region and a specific organelle that houses all our genetic information being the nucleus. And that concludes our first ever episode of VC Biology with Mr. Dean. I hope you've enjoyed. Please leave me any uh, recommendations you think on how I can do these and improve in the future. And it was great talking to you. See you next time.